the technical aspect. So there are times when you're a white belt and we do something to you and it's really like magic. Like Adrian out front, you're like, what just happened to me? You don't even understand the mechanics of the scissor sweep, but you were on top, now you're on bottom and it blows your mind. And then somewhere around uh, blue belt, purple belt, you kind of start getting the gist of what's going on. Uh, and then by brown and black belt, you realize, man, you really don't know anything anyway. And it, it allows you to kind of like step back and uh, address different aspects. And, and so what, where you may have come in for one thing, right? Jason Jones, why'd you start jujitsu? Because I was fat. Because he was fat, right? <laughs> so Jason lost 100 pounds. He wasn't fighting. <laughs> And after you eat his barbecue, you'll understand why he was <laughs> amazing barbecue. But, um, you know, Jason came in here to lose weight. He lost 100 pounds, and guess what? He's still doing jiu-jitsu. And while he likes the health benefits, he stays here because we got a rock star group of people, and he really, really, really likes to cook his barbecue. Uh, then there are people that come in here because they're getting bullied. They want self-defense. You know, you garner that skill set. You know, by the time you're middle blue belt, purple belt, you got the idea against people that don't know jujitsu, right? And then you stick it out, you're still here. Why are you still here? Well, you like the people here, you like the training. It mentally, physically, and emotionally stimulates you, right? Then, uh, maybe you came in because um, you've got an MMA fight coming up, and that's what you wanna work on, right, Justine? You wanna work on your, your grappling aspect, you're a professional. Well, that's different than learning self-defense, that's different than losing weight, uh, and some of those battles that people have are very easy to pick out, but some of them aren't. So I'm going to share a moment about my training and where I started and where I am now. Some of you knew me when I was a white belt and a blue belt. And there are a lot of people that hold me accountable for the things that I did when I was a white belt and blue belt. And they should. You know, uh, but to think that I haven't grown emotionally or with my jiu-jitsu would be a mistake. I counted a good training session with how many times I could tap someone. Did I pass someone's guard? Did I crush them? Did they get me? You know, and if they didn't get me, I was like, well, I didn't get tapped today. You know, like I was counting my wins. It didn't matter size. That's Matt, right? I was a big boy trying to crush Matt all the time. If I crushed Matt, it was a good training session. If I didn't crush Matt, it wasn't a great training session. And so then in my mind, in my mind, I thought I was going to be a world champion. I really thought that. Um, mind you, I had never rolled with a black belt in my life, and I thought I was going to be a black belt world champion. And so uh, some things happened at school. I ended up uh, graduating, and I made the decision I was going to move to Brazil. And I was like, you're not moving to Brazil. I'm, like, I'm moving to Brazil. I'm going to go to this guy, Gordo's Academy. It has a world champion, Pan Am champion, in the same division that I would be in. It'll be a good measuring stick. <laughs> So my first day in Brazil, mind you, I'd never rolled with black belt. My first match, world champion black belt. My second match, seven time world champion black belt, right? <laughs> Third match, world champion purple belt, which I was a purple belt at the time. My fourth match was a second degree black belt who loves to go, do you see that gringo? I'm gonna crush that gringo. <laughs> and then he would go crush the gringo, it was insane, right? And I remember I crawled on my hands and knees over to the corner after this training session and I was looking at the wall and I was like, what have I gotten myself into, <laughs> right? Like my return plane ticket doesn't go home for six and a half months, six months. And I was looking for a way out. But uh, over those next 10 weeks, I lost a lot. And I kept pulling myself together, going back to class because whereas I can deal with being a loser, being a loser is something that somebody crams down your throat against your will. You fight it every bit that you have, but sometimes you lose. Maybe the referee gave you a bad call. Maybe you're having an off day. Maybe you're battling some type of emotional or physical sickness that people can't see. You lose. That's part of the game, ladies and gentlemen. I can stomach losing, but I cannot stomach quitting. There is one person that decides if you're going to quit. And that's you. Your opponent can't make you quit. I mean, they can make you tap, but I'm gonna be here tomorrow and the next day and the day after. So, somewhere in that 10 weeks of not quitting, 
I realized that I wasn't going to be a world champion. That was a tough time for me, ladies and gentlemen. It was like watching a puppy dog get called, killed right in front of me. It was, it was terrible. Um, I had to readjust the way in which I viewed success in training, the way that I, I, I valued a good training session. It wasn't about crushing my training partners. It wasn't about winning. It was about training. I stopped competing against other people and started competing with myself. And the, the moment that I'm about to share with you that a lot of you don't know is I spent some time in Iraq and I have uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of you don't know it. And that's because the happiest time in my day is the time that I'm on the mat, ladies and gentlemen, with you. Not because I get to choke you, which is fun. <laughs> Not because I get to roll with you or I get to teach you, but because jujitsu is so immersive that I don't have time to think about anything else. And when I start speaking about that, some of you will understand that. Your loved ones, right? First, they're like, you go to jujitsu all the time. But then when you stay home, you start getting grumpy. They're like, you should go to jujitsu, right? <laughs> <laughs> you need to go train. And you might have a bad day at work. You might have an argument with a loved one. You might lose something or someone and it is a traumatic experience for you. And at first, you may not want to come here because you don't want to be around other people. We have a tendency to kind of stuff that down inside. But I encourage you to come to the academy, even when you're not feeling right, especially when you're not feeling right. Because in the moments when you're doing this, it's almost like meditation. You have to think all about this. While you're grappling, if you're not thinking about grappling, you're getting choked. Right? So you're literally fighting for your life. And so for me, jiu-jitsu is about dealing with the emotional trauma that I have. That's what I'm fighting for. I'm not necessarily fighting for weight loss, although I enjoy that aspect and the fitness aspect. I'm not necessarily fighting for self-defense. I'm here because it helps me cope with some things from outside of here. And each one of you is going to interact with your jiu-jitsu differently. And here's the really unique part, ladies and gentlemen. Youth is going to leave you at some point. Some of you are already knocking on that door, right? I felt, I felt it at 27. It is okay to readjust your relationship with your training in jiu-jitsu. There will be people that will be avid competitors and then they'll retire. What happens in retirement if you, if you valued your training sessions by winning? Jiu-Jitsu will fall by the wayside for you. If they canceled competitions, would you still be here? Uh -huh. So, that's what I'm fighting for. I don't know what you're fighting for. Some of you I do. It is my job as a coach to kind of try and assess what you're doing every time. Every time you come to class, every couple months, we start giving stripes, we start giving belts. So that brings me to stripes and promotions. We used to test for stripes, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of schools gave me a hard time about that. But running an academy can be difficult, especially when I'm trying to grade you based on what I have experienced. I talked to Mr. Tom about this last night. We have a tendency to see someone and when they get promoted or not promoted, we go, oh, they don't deserve that. Or why didn't I get promoted? And, and you want to question everything. And I, I challenge you to question everything. Question everything, that's cool. But, when I first got my black belt, how I measured purple belts is when they pushed me, right? If you pushed me uh, on the mat while we're grappling, hey, you're probably getting close to that purple belt level. And then at some point, I started having as easy of a time with most of the purple belts that I do with the blue belts. So that can't be a good measuring stick. We can't use ourself as the measuring stick because we are personally always in flux as well. Up, down, up, down. So you can't measure comparatively to yourself because that is an instrument that is constantly changing, ladies and gentlemen. When do we get promoted? I actually talked to William about this yesterday. Every instructor has a different rubric and a different method for which they promote their students. For me, personally, there will be days, who am I gonna use here? Daniel, he's a safe one, right? There are going to be days, Daniel comes in and he has a purple belt day. If you don't know, Daniel is a blue belt. 
He has a purple belt day. Maybe he submits some purple belts. Heck, maybe he even submits one of us. It doesn't make him a purple belt, ladies and gentlemen. You are going to have purple belt days. You're going to have purple belt moments. And the more you train, the more often you are going to have the moments of that next skill level. But just like that doesn't make you that next skill level, when you come in and have a white belt day, ladies and gentlemen, I have a white belt day every once in a while, we don't take the belts back. So at what point do we tie the belt on you? What, at what point do you make that transition into the next belt? Personally, it's when your next level days, we'll use the purple belt as an example, when you have more purple belt days than you have blue belt days. What, 51%, 55%, 60%? It's hard, you know, it's not, I don't have a little equation up front that I plug it into. You know, some of it is a guesstimate work. But when you start having more days uh, than that previous belt, to me, that is when you get promoted, and that will be different for everyone. Some instructors want 70% of your days, 80% of your days, 90% of your days. I think Lewis, for us, held a standard that was pretty crazy. It was like he wanted us, when we were blue belts, tapping purple belts before we got our purple belt, like consistently. I don't think that's a realistic expectation, ladies and gentlemen. I think it stunts your growth. I think it discourages you and stops you from achieving the next strength. Uh, with your skill level. So we're going to start to move into some promotions now. This is an exciting time. I challenge you to not use yourself as the measuring stick. Do not look at someone else getting promoted and go, but I, because I don't care about you in relation to them. I care about them in relation to them. So when they get promoted, I challenge you not only to not use yourself as a measuring stick, but to please cheer for your teammate because in a little bit of a way, you're getting promoted right along with them. We haven't given out stripes and promotions in a while, ladies and gentlemen, a good while. At some point, we became too large for that to happen consistently. When I had 50 students, we tested, I made sure I stayed up on top of everyone, gave you a little piece of tape, we feel really good. In a lot of places in Brazil, they didn't do stripes. You were either a blue belt or a purple belt. You're a purple belt, you're a brown belt. Stripes are a fairly new thing, especially when the belts are so long. So what has happened is some people have gotten disgruntled that they haven't gotten promoted because it's been a long time. I had one of the kids tell me it's been August since he was promoted. <laughs> right? I'm with you. I'm with you. The point where I made a decision to stop handing out stripes uh, on a regular basis and testing was because it took too much of our training time. When I have 200 students and we start talking about how many days in class that is, if I gave out one stripe a day, right, you should be getting about, if you're doing the right things between four months and a year, you should be getting a stripe, right? So with 200 students, let's say you're, you're really terrible students, but you're not. Let's say I give out one stripe a day. One stripe a day to adults. And uh, we lose four minutes on that. Because I have to call you up front, we all have to clap, I say something nice, we put the piece of tape on, and then you go sit down. Five minutes in every class. That's insanity, right? Five times 200, right? That's 1,000 minutes, right? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, a thousand minutes, a thousand minutes, right? A thousand minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Think about that in the long scheme of things. In a year, which is what we're talking about taking every year, I'm not going to take a thousand minutes of your training time to put a piece of tape on your belt. And so if you ever get disgruntled, you feel like you're losing your way or I'm not recognizing you, which I would have a hard time uh, envisioning that because I try to have a personal moment with everyone every time they come into class. If you feel like I'm, you're falling under the rug or that I'm, I'm not seeing you, come talk to me. We are in a unique situation. We have some traditional martial artists that have come here and they say, uh, don't ask about rank. Absolutely not. If you ask about rank, they're, they're going to get mad and they're not going to tell you, uh, or they're going to tell you, you're not getting promoted. We're going to make you wait another year, Shane, because you asked about your belt. Insanity. Absolute insanity. We are martial art but we are also a sport. I put my pants on the same way everyone in here puts their pants on, one leg at a time. Unless Jacob jumps in his. <laughs> uh, 
And what that means as an instructor, as a teacher, as a professor, is that I have a game plan for most of you. What you need to do is come talk to me, and it's not a hidden game plan. I'll just tell you exactly where you sit in the scheme of things that I see. And you know what? You're an adult. You can disagree with me, and we can talk about it. Right? I am an approachable person when it comes to rank, ladies and gentlemen. The only people that will be angry are the people that don't come talk to me. Do you understand, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. yes. All right. So we're going to move into some promotions now.